Fasten your seat belts. <laughs> the name of this title for today's message is called Change Your Mind and You Will Change Your Direction. Now, I want to make a statement. I want you to listen to this statement. God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five hours, five months, or five years. All right? Now, what would you say if I asked you to tell me the biggest problem that you're facing right now? Okay? Would you say your finances, family problems, sickness, job frustrations, your weight? If you said any one of those, in fact, if you listed any circumstances at all, you're mistaken, okay? I can tell you that if you are born again as a believer, money is not your problem. Sickness is not your problem. Your family, weight, job, background, lack of education, none of those things are your problem. Your problem is the way you've been thinking about these things, all right? Wrong thoughts will paint the wrong pictures in your mind. They tell you things are worse than they are. Now, in 2 Kings, so we're going to use the Bible as an example, God gives us an illustration of what a difference your thought patterns can make even in the worst situations. He tells us of a time when a city of Samaria was in absolute diabolical problems. Terrible situation. An enemy king had surrounded it with fortified troops and put it under a total siege. No one could go into the city and no one could go out. No food had entered that city for many months. As a result now, the people were starving. Now in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24 to 27, it tells us this. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that the donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money, isn't it? A cup of dove's dung, wow, sold for five pieces of silver. One day as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called him, please help me, my lord, my king. And he answered, if the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the wine press to give to you. Now this king was saying, look, there is no money. What do you expect us to do? Now the situation was tragically absolutely hopeless, all right? Now the king really was responsible for all these terrible problems and the misfortune that had fallen right across the land. He was not a God-fearing as a king of Israel, and they should have been, but he and the prophet Elijah knew it was his fault. But just like most people, he chose to blame his situation on somebody else. Now, human nature many times never looks at themselves. They like to place the blame for their situation on everyone else. Now, listen to what this king said next. Now in uh, Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 31. He said, May God strike me, even kill me, if I don't separate Elijah's head from his shoulders this very day. The king vowed, This evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now when the king sent someone to cut off Elisha's head, Elisha delivered a surprising message from the Lord himself. And it says this, then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall be your measure of fine flour, and it will be sold for a shekel. Two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now that's all Second Kings chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Now, here they are in the midst of the most desperate situation they've ever seen. There's no sign of hope anywhere. And the prophet of God says to them, 
hey, I've got good news. This is all going to be over by tomorrow, and we'll all be able to enjoy prosperity again. Now, God did not, was not creating the disaster. He doesn't do that, all right? He was the one with the solution to it. Yet, instead of rejoicing over this word of the hope that he, they, he given, 2 Kings 7, 2 says, The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. He was saying, I'll believe it when I see it. You met people like that? Which really means he didn't believe what the man of God had said anyhow. But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. That's the one who made the statement. Now, this man did not respond to God's word in faith, all right? He, his thinking was so geared towards the negative that he couldn't even imagine a positive turn of events. People wonder why so many bad things are happening to them. Well, one thing you need to do is check the words that come out of your own mouth. That's very, very important, all right? Now, the Bible teaches us you get what you say. You get what you're believing for, all right? Now, if you say you believe it when you see it, as some people do, you'll never get to see it, okay? Do you realize how much power your tongue has in your life and the lives of those around you? You can walk into a room and totally set the tone for the day in a positive way. Or you can set the tone for the day in a negative way. Now in James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, it says this. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now here the Bible is instructing us very clearly, telling us that the direction of our entire life is set by our tongue. That is very interesting, isn't it? Now, if you can say positive things, then you plant a positive seed, and positive things are going to come your way. That's what God is trying to teach us by his word. Your tongue can be a fire and ruin people's lives or reputations, or it can be a blessing to people. Your tongue controls your destiny. It controls the direction of your entire life. And the words of that king's officer controlled his destiny as well. Now, if we want to live the God kind of life, do you want to live a God kind of life? Of blessings and health, etc.? Okay. Then we must change our perspectives and not look at things through past disappointments. Everyone in this building right now, you've had past disappointments. Everybody. See? Now, poor thinking can produce poverty. Dwelling on sickness produces sickness. You can't hold on to those kinds of thoughts and walk in the power of God. Negative thinking, negative speaking, negative expectations cannot, will not produce success for you. Okay? It's very important. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Do you believe God is smarter than we are? Yes, he is. What he thinks is completely different than what we've been thinking at times. That's why we need to let the word of God, the wisdom of God, begin to influence our thinking. We need to dig it in, learn it, take it seriously. Now you can pray things like Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes, Lord that I may see the wondrous things in your word. Revelation 3.18. Touch me with yourself, that I may see. And then Ephesians 1 verse 18. Enlighten the eyes of my heart. And of course, there's many other words like that through the Bible. 
Now, in the twinkling of an eye, you can see something that you've never seen before, though it was right before you, all right? Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, knock and it will be open to you. That's good. And then we see in James 4, 2, so let it not be said of us, you do not have because you do not ask. That's interesting. We don't have because we're not asking him. Hmm. Now, through patience, perseverance, you inherit the promises. Correct? That's what the Bible teaches us. And then back in 2 Kings, as this siege was going on, and after the promise from the prophet of God, there were four lepers sitting outside the city gates. They weren't allowed in. Okay? They'd been thinking negative, fearful thoughts, just like everyone else. But then something happened. Suddenly their thinking suddenly began to change. They didn't know it, but they began thinking thoughts of God. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3 to 4 tell us this. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Now, why should we sit here waiting to die? They asked each other. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in this city and we shall die there. Now, if we sit here, we die here also. Now, therefore, come, let us fall into the hosts of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. Now, when the lepers viewed the utter hopelessness of their situation, and it was, they realized they had nothing to lose. So they decided to take action. Now, look. When a doctor looks at you and says, your disease is incurable, they're not lying to you, they're telling you the truth by medical science, right? And you have only, sometimes like in cancers and things, you only have a few months to live. That's a very hopeless situation, isn't it, you may face. Now, with all natural hope of recovery gone, no human effort can save you then. All right? Now, these four lepers in 2 Kings chapter 7, found themselves in that type of hopeless situation. They were cast out of the city because of their disease. These lepers were doing nothing but sitting and waiting to die. Now, many people today are doing much the same thing. If they're diagnosed with a terminal disease, they just sit and wait to die. Okay? If they're overwhelmed with life's problems... They just sit in despair and hopelessness. Yet deliverance is within their grasp. Now, to do nothing but sit and wait in a state of despair and hopelessness is exactly what the devil wants you to do. As long as the devil can keep you from acting in faith on God's word, he can keep you defeated. I'm sure some of you are learning that, and I've learned that. And by doing nothing, you're accepting defeat and hopelessness. You know, talking about lepers, I remember, this is coming to my mind, some of you have seen the film. I'd been in two leper colonies in India years ago, and we have film of it. Every one of them that came to listen and come in got healed. And you see their miracles? Some of you have seen that film. So God can do anything when we trust him and rely on him. Do you understand? I can speak boldly to you. I've seen these things. And who am I? I was nothing. I just started to believe in God. Amen? Now, if I could do it, why can't you do it? Isn't, isn't it the same Holy Spirit we all receive? I know there's different levels that God gives you to do certain things. Isn't it the same Jesus that saved us all? We're all the family of God. If you want it, you can have it. You've just got to believe it. It's your choice. Right? See, if we refuse to act in faith, unbelief, its consequences, will run rampant in your life. We live in a very fast-paced society today. We're, We're used to quick solutions, aren't we? But when it comes to exercising your faith, you can't just automatically develop faith. It takes time to develop your faith. Would you agree? 
Well, you have to, I'm telling you. It is true. It takes time, all right? It takes time to develop your faith. Now, the only way you're going to develop your faith is to exercise it according to the Word of God. The minute you try to just coast along spiritually, the devil will try to run you into the ground and defeat you. He is your enemy, all right? So these lepers said, why should we just sit here waiting to die? The four lepers who sat outside the gate of Samaria, they looked at one another and they said, what are we doing sitting here? If we're going to die, we might as well die trying to do something. That's really what they started to think. Now, if the lepers stayed where they were, they're going to die along with the rest of the starving people over the walls in the city. Or if the lepers were still alive when the enemy finally came to overrun that city, they would be killed by the sword. Either way, these men, they knew the end result was death. They were going to die. They had nothing to lose then by going to the Syrian camp. Now, the paraphrase of 2 Kings 7.4, the four lepers said this, if we're going into the city and they don't have any food, we'd die there anyhow. But if we just sit here, we die anyway. Therefore, we might as well go to the camp of the Syrians. We might as well die doing something rather than die doing nothing. Now, in a similar sense, some Christians aren't delivered or set free from their situations and circumstances because they don't make an attempt to be set free or delivered. That's fair enough, isn't it? In other words, they might need healing, but they don't do anything to receive their healing. And shame on the preachers that don't tell people they should be healed. God paid a price, a heavy price by Jesus. He died on that cross for your healing. That's what the Bible says. So if anybody tells you different, tell them you better learn to read the Bible properly. Okay? See, the Bible doesn't say to us, sit down and complain and do nothing, does it? It says, take your faith in God's word and stand. That's Ephesians chapter 6. Read verses 13 and 14. All right? So don't sit. Don't wait for the devil to destroy you. You have to take action to release your faith. You find scriptures that promise you what you need. Then you turn your faith loose by agreeing with it and speaking it over your circumstances. See, why sit still and just wait to die? The best way to go is like some famous preachers did. They preached the word of God, sat down and passed away. Some of the big ones did that. So if I just sit there one day down there, you know, just leave me alone. I'm going. Okay? Now, any person who has ever been delivered by the power of God has had to make up his mind whether he was going to accept death or deliverance. When you just sit on the promises of God and don't do anything, you will be defeated in life. But when you stand and act on God's word in faith, you will have deliverance and there is victory. Now, just as these four lepers did, you have to make up your mind you will not accept defeat, hopelessness, or despair. It's not up to God. Do you know what? It's up to you. We make the choices. Don't give up and die. Act in faith and take your stand. Don't ever give up. You can't act half-heartedly. You have to believe God with everything within you. You understand? And that means you have to act on God's word. You're the only one who can determine the outcome of your situation. God's given you the choice over your own life. It's all right having people pray for you, encouraging you, but it still comes back to you. Deliverance and victory already belong to you. So why, in any situation, spirit, soul, or body, why sit by idly and accept defeat? These four lepers sitting outside the city gates of Samaria knew they had nothing to lose, so they embarked on a very bold mission. Actions follow thoughts, right? 
You understand that? Whatever you're thinking is the direction you're going. Instead of sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, they jumped up and they headed towards the Syrian camp. Second Kings chapter 7, verse 5 to 6 tells us, And they, the lepers, rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. As they walked down the road, the Bible says the Syrians heard a noise. For the Lord had made the hosts of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, The king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. So now they're hearing this noise and they're thinking, Hey, we're sitting in a trap. All right. As they got closer to the enemy's camp, the scripture says that God caused the sound of their footsteps to be multiplied. Now you imagine that. Right? Here these four men didn't even know what was happening. Okay? They didn't even hear anything special. They just kept walking. Meanwhile, the enemy's camp began to panic. And they fled. When you dare to trust God and take some steps of faith, even when it looks impossible, you may not see anything happening. It may look like you're not making progress at all. Nothing is getting any better. But you don't realize that behind the scenes, God is doing something. You need to learn that. But only according, listen to me, only according to the words you speak. You don't realize how much power God's word is when it comes out of your voice. Because if you did, you'd be putting it to action a lot more. I mean, when you decide something about whatever situation you're facing, you don't know what your faith will set in motion if you just agree with God's word in it. You can't imagine the chain reaction of events that can be set off when you rise up, put your faith in motion. Now, 2 Kings 7, 7 tells us, Wherefore they, the Syrians, arose, they fled in the twilight, they left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. Do you know what they discovered when they arrived? No one was there. The camp was abandoned. Now, it was filled with the abundance of food, clothing, and supplies. But all the soldiers were gone. These lepers had stumbled onto a spiritual law. God had already moved on their behalf. And I want to tell you something, where you're in a situation and you start to pray, you don't know the answers, how you can get out of it. As long as you pray and ask God to lead and guide you, He's already started moving on your behalf. Amen? If you quit, you stop God anyhow. That's not his fault. It can only work on faith. That's a spiritual law. When you understand these things, it'll encourage you. See? You just have to believe it and act upon it. Now, in Isaiah 53, he sent Jesus to the cross to bear your sicknesses. Your weaknesses and pain, that's what it tells you. And I can't understand where people today say, oh, but that's all finished. Well, why did God put it in the Bible for us? It's in the New Testament scriptures for us to learn. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, by his stripes, when they whipped him, you are healed. 2 Corinthians 9 says, he became poor so you could become rich. Oh. Oh, no, we, we, that's not good for us to be rich. Well, suffer poverty then. It's, see, it comes back to your choice. If you don't read what God's done for you, well, is that God's fault? He's given us a whole Bible, a whole lot of instruction over a 2,000-year period from when it started that we have the completeness of the Old Testament as well as the New. And we have a better covenant now. Some of the richest people that ever lived were under that old covenant, and yet it says ours is better. Okay? Now, you don't go seeking after riches. What God is saying to you, 
my God shall supply all your needs. Okay? If you start with that, it's up to you how far you go. In Philippians 4.19, it says, He, this is God, covenanted with you to meet all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1.3 says, He has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. All things. The only thing powerful enough to keep you from receiving these things is your own thinking and speaking. We have to learn to come in agreement with God. Now, we don't understand everything we see when we see a scripture sometimes. We have to meditate on it, try and find out. Sometimes another person may give you an answer. Not always deliberately, but just they'll share something with you and it'll come to pass. Now, listen to me. Wrong thoughts, and we've all had them at times, and we realize, well, that was a wrong thought. They paint the wrong pictures in your mind. They'll tell you things are worse than they are. They'll tell you that you can't do what it takes to succeed in life. But I'm here to tell you that you can succeed. God had supernaturally frightened the Syrian army into running away and leaving all their supplies behind. They were a good disciplined army. Hmm. 2 Kings 7, verse 8 to 9 says, When these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, ate and drank, carried from it silver and gold and clothing. And they went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Now in a single moment, they went from having nothing to plenty, from starving to satisfaction. Finally, I like this, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. Now, this account is relevant to the subject of sharing your faith. One of the strongest motivations of all for telling others about Jesus is a realization of an abundant provision that we have in him. Just like the people of Samaria, people all around you are literally starving all over this world. Third world nations, if you ever went there, you would see. When I first went to Venezuela, I saw people eating cats, dogs, rats, anything. That's why I wouldn't touch their food. I'm telling you the truth. And it hasn't changed that much either. Just like the people of Samaria, people all around you are literally starving. They're starving for peace. Not much peace in the world now, is there? Starving for healing. Starving for forgiveness. Starving for spiritual life. Just like those lepers, you've discovered a veritable king's treasure of provision if you really know Jesus Christ. All right? Treasure, I'm saying. Yes, a treasure. Philippians 4.19 says, God is supplying all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, when that reality hits home, you'll respond the same way that these lepers did. You say, I can't keep this to myself. I must tell them. You don't have to starve anymore. I've discovered a wealth of provision. Come see for yourself. Now, that's why the devil works overtime to keep you focused on your own problems, your own needs, right? He wants you worrying about them. Hmm? For example, once you recognize that all that is yours in Christ Jesus, you're likely to run out and tell someone else about it, aren't you? You know, I don't mean you run around the streets with a phone shouting out, but you know, you tell your friends, you tell people that you're close to. See? So God used the faith of those four lepers that way to bring them victory to them and the entire city of Samaria as well. 
Now God amplified the sound of the leper's weary feet dragging on the ground. Just think of this for a miracle. The Syrians heard what sounded to them like a host of horsemen, chariots coming to overtake them. That, that's amazing, isn't it? You know, we, we say, oh, I don't know whether God would do this. Or that. Look what he did with four lepers. They'd be dragging their feet. They wouldn't be stomping around. Amen. Four lepers changed the course of their nation because they refused to sit still and just wait to die. When these four lepers decided to take action, they obtained deliverance, victory for themselves, as well as the entire city. That's faith in action. So we need to get up and do something about our own situations. We've got to use our faith to get up, come to Jesus, because faith, only faith, releases the power of God, I'm telling you. Few people have ever received deliverance or success who weren't willing to go after it, okay? Few people have ever been delivered from sickness or disease who didn't reach out for the victory, as these four lepers did, okay? These lepers were very bold. They walked through the camp, entering every tent, seizing what they wanted. That would have been good for a leper, wouldn't it? You think about it. They lived in poverty. Not only did those lepers get fed, they also got rich. When they broke out of their paralysis and took a step, they got their needs met. Then it occurred to the lepers to report to their fellow Israelites what they'd found. So the lepers returned to the others who were dying in the city, shouting, and they said, we have the answer. We found help. Do you want something to eat? Do you want gold and silver? The Syrians are gone, but all their possessions are in the camp for us to take. It's ours for the taking. And the people in the city responded just like some of your friends, relatives, even some people in church, members, you know, respond. When you tell them of all the good things that God has done for you, at first they don't believe it. 2 Kings 7.12 says, the king said, that's just a trick to get us down there mm. so they can destroy us. Now, the day before the lepers rose up, took their journey of faith into the camp of the Syrians, the prophet Elijah had said this. It's in 2 Kings 7, 1. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. Now, you know, the donkey's head cost all that silver. The dung cost silver. Shekel must have been the lowest amount of their money. Yet when the lepers reported that the prophet's words had come to pass, just a little over 24 hours later, at first the people in the city did not believe God would set them free. They did not believe that deliverance belonged to them. I'm telling you now, probably 90% of the church, do not believe God wants you to live a victorious life. Be set free in this world right now. Doesn't believe that God will provide for you. Many of them are scared stiff of what's coming in the world. Oh, what will we do? But if you've got God inside you, God will lead you and guide you and provide for you. I'm telling you now. And we need to rise up and wake up like the children of Israel had to do, we're in the same situation now. If you've got a brain, you know this world is deteriorating and it will not change. Why? Because we read the Bible. We know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. But do you know what God says happen? He takes us out first. He looks after us. Yes, things might get a little tough, but God is on our side. And you know what the Bible tells us? The devil... Antichrist, all the false prophets, all the disbelievers of this world can do nothing about it till we go. You're what prevents them. Amen. And you've got to need to wake up to that and believe. Amen. Believe God. Now, 
just to remind you, the day before the lepers rose up to take their journey of faith into the camp of the Syrians, this is what Elisha the prophet said in 2 Kings 7.1. Tomorrow, about this time, so only 24 hours had gone by, you shall see a measure of fine flour to be sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel. Isn't that interesting? Yet, when the lepers reported what they'd found and got, the prophet's word had come to pass, but at first the people in the city didn't believe. They couldn't believe God would set them free. Now let's understand their circumstances. It was impossible in the natural, in their thinking. They didn't believe that deliverance belonged to them. That's the problem. Now, if you believed in God, and God has picked you as his nation, which Israel was, right? Well, if he's God, he can do anything, can't he? If God has saved you from all your sins, past, present, future, he's healed you at different times, he's poured his own spirit into you to guide, lead, and direct you in life, all things are possible. Not just fancy whims, but I mean genuine problems that come at you, all right? If you want deliverance, if you want to receive God's best, you must first believe and understand and know that it belongs to you. Then you can't just sit still and wait. You've got to take hold of what belongs to you by faith. Speaking God's word. Not speaking what it is. Not speaking the doubts, the fears, and the problems. Speaking the answer. So make a determined effort to find out what the word of God promises you. And then act on what God said is already yours. Now remember this. God does move in spectacular ways sometimes. But if you just sit around waiting for the blessings of God to come to you without any effort on your part, you may wait a long time. Whatever you need from God is within your grasp because God's promises to you is in his word. But if you appropriate by faith the deliverance and the victory that already belongs to you, and you come to God to receive, then and only then will you receive your needs met by the power of God. And he can do that in mysterious ways. Why worry about that? If you're going to receive, just receive. Let God do it any way he likes. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3. Then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, and 2 Peter 1, 3 basically say this. Through Christ Jesus, God has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings, provided us with all things that pertain to life, that's the life we're living now, and godliness. Then 2 Kings 7, 14 to 19 continues. So two chariots with horses were prepared, and the king sent scouts to see what had happened to the Armenian army. Then the people of Samaria rushed out and plundered the army camp. So it was true that five quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver, and ten quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate, but he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as a man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. He didn't believe it could happen. Even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven, remember, even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven, it couldn't happen. And the prophet had said to him, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And so it was as the people trampled him to death at the gate. There were some good things in the Old Covenant, but there's some bad things if you didn't have faith right. Hmm. He got exactly what he said. Can you see that? Okay. Now, for us, will you continue to sit and accept defeat? Are you going to rise up and accept victory? Listen, it's not up to God. It's up to you. 
So don't just sit in a state of hopelessness and despair. We see the news every day. We see things, deterioration in this world. Everything seems to be going wrong. Notice the weather patterns around the world. Massive floods where it's still summertime in some places that don't normally get floods. I've never had floods like that in the USA. Like we had last year. Now they're trying to tell us we're having it again. Do you know what we should do? Start praying. No, we're not. We can change the course of events if we agree with God. Maybe we should start doing that in the prayer meeting. Rise up. Come to Jesus. Be set free, if you need to, from the power of sin, sickness, disease, or any test, any trial that hurts or destroys. We've got to choose deliverance. Remember, our God is God. He's in charge. He's in charge of what we agree with through his word. We can change the circumstances.